So please open your Bibles. Uh, the kids need to be dismissed. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, so please uh, head out to your children's ministry class. And as they do that, uh, please open your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verses 29 to 34. And this is what the Word of God states. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifest to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Today in this passage, we will affirm four tremendous truths about the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God as evidenced by these four powerful confessions. And the first is the Lamb of God saves, and we'll see that in verse 29. The second is that the Lamb of God is superior, verse 30. And number three, the Lamb of God sanctifies, and we see that in verses 31 to 33. And number four, the Lamb of God is supreme, verse 34. Allow me to just give you a bit of background to this morning's passage. It comes in the first chapter of John, and the first chapter of John establishes the entire gospel. It is quite an important opening, and for the first 14 verses particularly, it lays out who the Word of God is, that the Word of God is Jesus Christ. Along that, we are introduced to John the Baptist. The words of this passage are his words. He is a humble servant of God and is, is sent as a forerunner to prepare the people for Jesus' ministry. And John the Baptist was under scrutiny by the religious authorities from Jerusalem, and they needed to know the answer to this question for, for John. And we see that question in verse 19. They ask him, who are you? And in reply, plainly, truthfully, John states that he is not who they think he might be. Now moving to our passage, starting in verse 29, John the Baptist begins with his first confession, which is that the Lamb of God saves. The Lamb of God saves, verse 29. As our passage begins with the words, the next day, it alerts us, the reader, that this is part of, a, of consecutive events. Things are happening here. And these series of days reveal to us who Jesus is. They serve to develop a positive identification of the long-awaited, the coming Savior to which John the Baptist pointed to. And as each day progresses, a deeper picture of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, is revealed. For generations, the people were awaiting their coming Messiah who was prophesied about in the scriptures. And when the word spread about John the Baptist's ministry, it naturally gained a lot of attention. So in response to the Baptist ministry, the religious authorities tried to figure out what is all this fuss? What is happening here? What is this stir? 
and particularly what is happening. Why are so many people going out to see John the Baptist? And so they questioned him as to whether he was the Christ. Is he the Messiah that we have been waiting for? And the Baptist's reply was, no, he was not. And they questioned to him as to whether he was Elijah, because they expected from the Old Testament that Elijah would come back, or maybe he was the prophet. And once again, they received the answers, no and no. Instead, John declares himself to be the voice, the voice, the one whom God chose to point others to the perfect, sinless Messiah or Savior. And his role as a voice was to call the people to prepare for their Christ to come. And now the Baptist does do that. This is the point in in human history that the Messiah was going to be revealed. His ministry was to begin. And so John the Baptist can decisively point at Jesus because Jesus was now coming toward him. He was on the horizon. He was walking towards John the Baptist. It was such an exciting moment in human history, in salvation history. And in the pinnacle of anticipation, he exclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Imagine that. Imagine to be able to see Jesus coming and just to declare the truth. And so John the Baptist declares, Behold, or look, drawing attention to Jesus. And John then attributes to Jesus the messianic title, the Lamb of God. And John anticipates something so important to this gospel account, which is the foreshadowed cross, the cross of Christ, which he is to die upon. That Jesus Christ is the Lamb, yet a spotless Lamb, who is able to permanently take away the sin of his people, to take away our sin. And with this statement, there is a possible link to the Passover celebration, which looms just over the horizon in chapter 2. The Passover commemorates the time that the Jews were delivered from slavery in Egypt, as judgment upon the nation for Pharaoh's obstinance, as it relates to the, specifically to the tenth plague, upon the Egyptians. And if you remember the 10th plague, the Lord sent the angel of death to pass over the Jewish homes on which the doorposts were sprinkled with blood. We see that in Exodus chapter 12. And as the angel passed over these homes, those who did not have the blood of the lamb upon the doorposts, the result was that the firstborn of both men and animal of these homes were judged by death. In the Old Testament, we have the concept of a ritual taking away of sin through the life of a sacrificial animal. And it was a wiping away of sin, a covering over, as the Hebrew word kephar indicates, it is a getting rid of sin. It's that covering over specifically symbolized by its blood, which was required in exchange for the life of the worshiper. An innocent lamb in place of the guilty sinner. And this act constitutes what is known as the atonement. The atonement is the act where we are made to be at one with God. So if you take that word atone, that big word, atone, atonement, and you take the word atone and you split it up, A-T, at, and then O-N-E, one, that helps us remember, at one, because the atonement is that Christ died so that we could be at one with God. And so we find that Jesus, the Lamb of God, saves. 
His innocent life was given in our place for our guilty lives. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. And that's why he will come again. And only those who are genuine in faith and repentance received its permanent benefit, which was the complete forgiveness from God. That God's forgiveness was not based on any animal sacrifice, but on the one that is Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. It's interesting to note here in verse 29 that the word sin is used and not the plural sins. And the point is that the Baptist is not only looking at a number of individual acts of sin, but looks to the broader scope. And so he foreshadows the cross and he acknowledges that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, his sacrifice is sufficient. In the Old Testament sacrifice, sacrificial system, the, the priest would have to bring the lamb. Again and again, another lamb, another lamb, another lamb, over and over and over. But this lamb, the lamb of God, because of he is the perfect lamb of God, his sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for all time. That's how important John the Baptist's message is. Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. It is sufficient for taking away the totality of the world's sin, but yet only for those who are chosen, so it's not for everyone. It's not that everyone will be saved. That's what this verse means. And though the forgiveness of sin is offered, only those who repent of sin and receive and believe upon the works of Christ, submitting to him in obedience as Lord and Savior, will that sacrifice, the atonement, will become efficacious. And we know this because verses 11 and 12 in this contest state that Jesus Christ, quote, came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So we know that not everyone will receive Jesus Christ. Continues to state, yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The word, word world speaks of the comprehensive nature of Christ's work on behalf of to satisfy, satisfy God's just wrath upon the sinner. That Christ's death and resurrection is adequate for anyone who would come in humble confession and faith to the Lord for his salvation, for your sin, just as many of us here this morning have. One Old Testament passage which points to this and to this forgiveness is Jeremiah 31. And I'll just read portions of it. In verse 33, it says, I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And it continues, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. The statement is the Old Testament announcement of the new covenant which tells us the reality of the results of the coming of Jesus Christ which we as believers are a part of when we are born again and through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us we are now a new creation in Christ and all our sins have been forgiven and therefore, we also have a passage such as 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, which tells us this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to, and will forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. So in this verse from 1 John, it points us to the fact that God will indeed forgive us if we confess our sins to him. In order to be assured of God's forgiveness, we need to accept and act upon what God states in his word. And when we have generally sought out 
God's forgiveness through repentance of sin. Repentance means have a change of mind before we would say, you know, we, whatever sin it is, we, we have to be honest. We love that sin. And we have a change of mind, that repentance. And we now agree with God what his word says about that sin. And we need to turn away from that sin. And so when we ask God in repentance to forgive us, God will remember our sins no more. That is amazing grace. And God will forgive you of your sins. And he will purify you of all unrighteousness. This morning I direct this to some of you this morning who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, who are not born again. That there is no sin in your life that cannot be forgiven by God, by the perfect Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who saves. And so it reveals that Jesus Christ takes away our sins as a perfect sinless sacrifice on your behalf if you repent of your sin this morning and you put your complete trust in Christ alone. John the Baptist adds further weight to his testimony, and this time it relates to the proper identification of the Messiah he just pointed to. And he states on behalf of the one he points to that number two, the Lamb of God is superior. The Lamb of God is superior, verse 30. And as we look at this first, the, the focus is solely upon the Lamb of God. And it says, this is he. This is he whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And this is in the following context of chapter 1 and verse 45. And so this man that John speaks on behalf of is the one who is superior to and having priority over the Baptist and also having authority over all. And John the Baptist is now able to point out and give details about the, the sovereignty of Jesus Christ beyond a shadow of a doubt. Though the Baptist is ministering to the people first to prepare them for the Messiah, he says then, after me comes a man. And that man is Jesus. And John makes clear that Jesus, the Lamb of God, is superior. And yet he states of Jesus that he existed before me, which is an interesting statement. And I'm going to expand on that in a moment. Yet Jesus Christ, he expresses, is superior because the Baptist uses in his description of Christ a man. And we see that John balances and expands the reality of who Jesus is for the people. In the context to the opening verses of chapter 1, Jesus Christ is the God-man. For the Lamb of God is fully human, and yet he is also fully God. He is fully the eternal word of God. And so in verse 30, the Baptist affirms the superiority of the incarnate word. And the incarnate means that Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, came in flesh and he dwelt among us. And that is a historical fact. We see that fact of that reality in the context of verse 14 of chapter 1. And so in this declaration, John humbly declares two profound truths. Without any question, John reveals that Jesus Christ, though coming on the scene after him, A, that Jesus has a higher rank than him, and B, Jesus existed before the Baptist. So A, Jesus has a higher rank than him. This emphasizes that Jesus is preeminent, that Jesus is preeminent. That's what John is communicating. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, it states, He, meaning Jesus Christ, He is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. And that word firstborn in Greek has the meaning of preeminent. And so Jesus Christ has a higher rank. And John the Baptist also says, B, Jesus existed before him. And this emphasizes that Jesus had, was eternally pre-existent. We see that also in the first verse, first and two verses of this chapter. And back to Colossians, it continues in verse 16 and affirms this also, for by him, once again Jesus, all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And so that reveals who Jesus Christ is. In summary, John is declaring to the people that, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is our preeminent, eternal one. He is the creator. He is the Messiah. That the Lamb of God indeed is superior. And therefore, the message is, pay attention to Jesus. He alone provides the only way to be saved. Not only is that Jesus Christ saves and that Jesus Christ is superior over everything, now John, in verses 31 to 33, delivers his third powerful confession of Jesus Christ, which is number three, the Lamb of God sanctifies. The Lamb of God sanctifies. At this point in our passage, we should note that John has already baptized Jesus earlier. And up to that point, John the Baptist makes the claim that he did not recognize Jesus. Scripture does not mention if John the Baptist and Jesus actually uh, met one another personally before this event, but we know that they were related to one another from Luke chapter one. And the knowledge that Jesus was indeed the Messiah did did come through God's revelation to John the Baptist later. And this was revealed at the baptism of the Messiah. And this is why John said, I came baptizing in water, in order that God's plan to make the Messiah known to Israel would be fulfilled. That job of baptizing in water was given to John in order so that we could identify who Jesus was, the Messiah. So a question that arises for Christians is this, and maybe you've asked this question before. Since Jesus is God, why did he have to be baptized? Right? That's a good question. And so the answer is, sign up for the baptismal course. <laughs> I'm not going to give you the answer. Well, I'll talk a little bit. Now, at this junction of human salvation history, the Baptist states, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. And so the descent of the Spirit was a visible event. The Spirit of God manifested himself as a dove. The ESV, I'm, I'm actually preaching from the text of NASB, but the ESV says, like a dove, which is, I think, clearer. And he reveals, he manifests himself in this way as a sign. The dove to the Jews, it seems, is associated to us as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. It's important to note that the Holy Spirit is not a dove. That's why the ESV says like or as a dove. And again, John says, I did not recognize him. It was only the sign which God used to confirm to the Baptist so that he could recognize who the Messiah was as the Spirit descended and was remaining upon Jesus. That was the indication. That was the unique indication, the revelation that was given to John when he sees that this is the one. Behold, this is the Lamb of God. This is the Messiah. And so the presence of the Spirit of God coming out of heaven served to authenticate Jesus' earthly ministry. This is why John was faithful to carry out the ministry of baptism, and he gained his title through 
that very action. Baptism with the Holy Spirit was foreshadowed in the Old Testament in the book of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel reveals God's future plans of restoration for his people in chapter 36. And it looks forward to the time of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, as he is the one who sanctifies through the Holy Spirit. Sanctify means to set apart for holiness because God is holy. In Ezekiel 36, verses 25 to 27, it says this, I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Sounds kind of familiar, right? That is the parallel passage to Jeremiah 31 in reference to the new covenant. In the Lamb of God, the new covenant is fulfilled. In Jesus Christ, we are cleansed. We are washed clean from our sins through his saving grace imparted to the one who believes upon Christ and sets us apart for righteous deeds. It is Jesus Christ who baptizes the born-again believer with the Holy Spirit. And so what is baptism in the Holy Spirit? And the theology of this topic is very relevant for our day and age in, in church history, in the modern church. Uh, it is, as I mentioned before, about being a Baptist church. It is very important for us to understand what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So you know what the answer is, right? <laughs> Take the course. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it a lot. But it is something that is very important because there is a lot of misinterpretation of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. So finally, we'll find our last important confession. Number four, the Lamb of God is supreme, verse 34. In verse 34, John supports all that he has stated so far by, uh, by a far-reaching and profound declaration. He says, I myself have seen. And this is, therefore, his eyewitness account. It is a solid testimony of Jesus Christ by a fourth confession that this is the Son of God. He once again gives us, the reader, the positive identification of who the Lamb of God is, and John emphatically declares through another messianic title, which he uses, which is the Son of God. He uses the Lamb of God, messianic title, and now he uses another messianic title, the Son of God. And he declares by using that, those two terms, that the, law, the Lamb of God is supreme. And once again, the focus of John the Baptist is on the identification of the Lamb of God, and this time it is on his supremacy. This is the concern of the Baptist because God sent him to be the witness to the Messiah. John was the voice preparing the way for the Messiah's arrival, and now that the Messiah is here, he states, I myself have seen, I have testified, this is the Son of God. There's no wavering to that declaration. It is black and white. It is absolutely clear. And so John makes that identification and he points to Jesus Christ alone. And this is also the concern of the Apostle John as he recounts the good news or, or in other words the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the Son Jesus has a special relationship with his Father. It speaks of an intimate and unique knowledge of the Father that Jesus Christ alone shares the same nature as the Father. And later on in the Gospel, Jesus on several occasions applies to himself this special relationship of being the Son of God. 
And in so doing, Jesus asserted his deity. As it states in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. In other words, Jesus is God. And the purpose of why Jesus came into the world is that Jesus being the Son of God is the chosen one that would be in fulfillment of God's plan of salvation. Jesus has been chosen as a suffering servant, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. No one else can take away your sin. No one except for Jesus Christ. And so if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, Acts 4, as we've learned in verse 12 in the exposition of Acts that we've been going through, it says, there is no salvation in, there is salvation in no one else. No one else except for Jesus Christ. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. So if you don't know Jesus Christ this morning, and you're chasing after spirituality maybe, maybe you're chasing after work, maybe you're chasing after titles, degrees, you're chasing after the wrong thing. Those things will not satisfy you in the end because God created us to find our delight, our satisfaction, our salvation in Christ alone. So I want you to think about that this morning. As we close in our passage today, we have come to understand four important confessions of who Jesus Christ is. And in these confessions, there is personal application for each one of us. Number one, Jesus Christ takes your place and is the only perfect sinless sacrifice for the penalty of our sin which pleases God so that he forgives you of all your sins. So indeed, Jesus Christ saves. Jesus Christ surpasses all of us because he is the preeminent and eternal Savior and therefore he is superior. And so take note. And number three, Jesus Christ sets you apart for holiness when he saves you. Jesus Christ indeed sanctifies you. He makes you holy. He forgives us our sins. And so therefore you can please God and live the way and that he created you to live in this world, in this short life. Number four, Jesus Christ is the only way in which we may be saved because he is the son he is our great God and Savior, and therefore Jesus Christ is supreme. I leave you with these two questions to seriously reflect upon, maybe this day and uh, this week. One is, have you turned your life over to the Lamb of God as your Lord and Savior? And number two, how do you reflect these four confessions in your life each day. Let's pray. Lord God, we are thankful for your word. Your word, indeed, as the psalmist declares, is a light unto our path. It points us to the way that we should go. And Lord, most of us here this morning can give you thanks and praise you because you have shown us through your word not only in your word, but your word preached that we were sinners dead in our trespasses. And yet you sent Jesus Christ to die for us, us the ungodly, in exchange for your perfect son's righteousness and his holiness as he is the Lamb of God. He gave us his righteousness as we believed upon him. And it was Christ who even gave us faith to believe. And so, Lord, 
all the glory belongs to Christ. It is his work. It is his salvation granted to us when we did not deserve it. And so, Lord, this passage this morning also highlights this truth, that indeed Jesus Christ is our perfect lamb, that he, his sacrifice on the cross is completely sufficient, that it ended the, the Old Testament sacrificial system, that no longer, as it says in Hebrews, that in the Old Testament, the, the priests would have to stand over and over again. But now that Christ has come, that he has died for our sins according to the scripture, that he was buried and raised on the third day from the dead, and once again, according to the scripture, that we might have salvation. And so, Lord, I do pray for those this morning who are here that your word might not go unnoticed. And, Lord, that you would be working on the hearts of those that do not know you, that you would grant them salvation this day. Cause them to repent, to recognize their sin and repent, to have that change of mind and cast themselves upon your mercy at your throne of grace. And for us who do believe, Lord, help us to be reminded of our salvation. Help us not to neglect our salvation. Help us to live out these four confessions whether it is to preach the gospel to others or uh, just to be reminded to be, uh, that we need to be uh, mindful of our sanctification, Lord, to live holy lives before you. And Lord, we know that you will forgive when we do not live the way that you desire us to. Forgive us when we've sinned. And so, Lord, we... Your word humbles us. It opens our eyes to the truth so that you might be glorified in us. And so we give you thanks this morning for your word. And we pray in the name of the word, Jesus Christ. Amen.